which means now more than ever, I need to pay very close attention to the clock, because the longer we get, people's eyeballs start swimming. Not good, right? So we are gonna we're gonna get into it um, this morning. But I'm I'm excited about getting into this text. I'm excited about this series. Uh, we tied up our 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 sermon series as we looked all through the life of Christ, looking at different elements of Him and His His Lordship. Absolutely, Amen, sister. All right. And so we we looked very closely at, at the life of Christ, right? And 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 all the things that we've gleaned from that over this last period of time. And so now what we're looking at is the early church. What did it mean for those people then who have now put on Jesus as Lord? And what does that look like? And so last week, Jim had the chance to go through Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when it was kind of that first moment of what is happening. And here's this sermon. We're going to look at that because that ties into the very, very last part. And I love this chapter because it's a chapter that shows what devoted looks like and what devotion looks like. First of all, what, what devotion looks like when you're, when, you're, when you're putting on Jesus as Lord, and then how to live a devoted life after that. Uh, we had the chance to talk about this a little bit last week with the brothers and sisters at Cherry Point. I had the chance to be there. They send their greetings and they send their love. That was really cool having the opportunity to be there. But I am thankful to be back uh, with, with family here. So let's go ahead and get into it, because I want to start... <coughs> right at the very beginning of Acts chapter 2, just again to reacquaint ourselves with what we looked at last week, because this is the absolute crux of the matter. It all hinges on this before you then get into the later verses in chapter 2, right? And so starting in verse 14, when you're looking at Peter's sermon, okay, one of the most important parts of this, and sometimes we used to just breeze through it. Oftentimes we look at Acts chapter 2 and we think, all right, here's verse 38. That's the most important part, right? The response to the gospel. And we almost kind of like make it like, here's the key verse here for, for all of scripture. Sometimes the way we talk about it and the way we elevate it, right? But when you're looking at Acts chapter two, don't miss the Old Testament passages that are in there because he refers back to Joel chapter two. Everything hinges on this because what happens on Pentecost is they're all gathered there and something really weird happens where, has anybody here ever been around a tornado? Anybody here ever been around a tornado? All right, so a few folks, folks have been, right? No bueno, not fun. You don't really want to spend much time hanging around tornadoes, right? But one of the things you hear about people when they talk about tornadoes is the sound of what? Like a freight train. Yeah, exactly, right? So you guys are all nodding in agreement. The sound of a freight train. You hear that sound of a freight train, and if you have a basement, you get down there. If not, you get in the bath, put the mattress over, and you pray really hard, right? So that's the, that's the tornado lowdown, right, when it's, when it's coming. So imagine, right, you're there in Jerusalem, and you hear the sound of the freight train. You hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. You hear the sound of a tornado or some kind of crazy windstorm, or like we're more accustomed to hurricane force winds, and you hear it. But there's no, no visual effects of it, and nothing's happening. And you're looking around, you're like, what's that noise? Where's the tornado? What's happening, right? That's what they hear. And so then at that point, you then see this gift of the Holy Spirit that comes on the apostles, right? And the speaking in tongues as they're talking in languages, and people are understanding what they're saying. And there's this mass confusion because everybody's going, what in the world is, what in the world is happening here? So Peter gets up. And he starts preaching, okay? Now, this is Peter, the guy who just not too long beforehand was too afraid to even say, Jesus is Lord. Too afraid to even say, I'm a disciple of his. And now he gets up in front of all Jerusalem, right? Everybody that's there, everybody that's gathered. And here's what he says in verse 14. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and he addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. This is not denying, cowering Peter here, right? Everybody in Judea, all of you who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, all right? So listen, he's saying, listen, for these people are not drunk as you suppose. That's their conclusion, by the way, right? When this is happening. 
They've obviously not really spent any time around Scotland because he uses, he uses the chronology argument since it's only the third hour of the day, right? That's, that's irrelevant in Scotland, right? But he says, verse 15, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the, third hour of the day. So then what he does is he goes back to Joel chapter 2 and he says, here's a prophecy from Old Testament and he says, this is happening now. This is being fulfilled now. What you're seeing, here it is. And it was talked about before, and now it's been fulfilled. And so in verse 17, now it's, it's figurative language, right? It's very figurative language, but he's saying this is what's happening. Verse 17, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And so he's saying, here's this fulfillment of Joel 2. This is happening now. And from here on, some of these things that we see in Acts that they end up doing as they're preaching and sharing the gospel and working miracles throughout Jerusalem, some of the amazing things that they end up doing, it's all in fulfillment of this passage. But it doesn't end there because it says in verse 21, when this happens, when this period of time comes, when we're living in this period right here, verse 21, and it shall come to pass. What shall? That everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter says, here's what's happening. Here it is in Joel 2. And at this point, everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if I hear that, my question then as I'm hearing that and all this amazing stuff has happened is, all right, well, so who's the Lord? Who's the Lord? And how can I call upon his name to be saved? And Peter's sermon from here on is like this masterclass of, of answering those questions and showing exactly who the Lord is, right? And then the response to it that happens as a result. So everything is pivotal on that Old Testament prophecy in that passage, and it goes forward from there. So if you then fast forward, because he goes back and he looks at Psalms and he talks about, this wasn't talking about David, but it was pointing towards Jesus. And he gets to the point where he's working towards his conclusion in verse 32. This Jesus, God raised up. And of that, we are all witnesses. So we've, we've, we've seen it. We know we're witnesses of this. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Pause there. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So you looked at that last week, what happened. And he's also reminding them it was prophesied in Joel 2. And now it's coming to fulfillment. For David didn't ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And this is the crux of the matter. Verse 38 is is the response to this. 36 is one of the most powerful verses you will ever read. And I love actually that Noah spoke about it in our communion, right, this morning. Because he says here, this is his conclusion, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain what? That God has made him, who's him? Jesus, both Lord, right? So dominion and rule and Christ, Messiah, the anointed one, the sent one, this Jesus whom you crucified. That, everything hangs on that. So that is the conclusion right there of his sermon. That's that kind of final, you know, punch at the end of the sermon. And he's saying, here it is. All right, here's the Old Testament that points to this. Know for certain, have no doubt, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The absolute crux of the matter there in verse 36. And as we know, as Noah already mentioned, they're gutted, right? That's how we say it, they're gutted, right? They're cut to the heart. They recognize, they hear this, and they say, wait a minute, we, we were part of this, okay? So then in their, in their upsetness, right, in, their, in being cut to the heart, 
they, they ask Peter and the rest of the, and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Well, he's already told them what they need to do from Joel 2, which is what? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he's just told them who the Lord is. He says, I want you to know for certain this Jesus whom you crucified is Lord and Christ, the one that we've been waiting for. So that's been answered as well. So how do you call upon his name is kind of the next part, right? And so when they ask that, what shall we do? How do we call upon his name? Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's like in his authority, right? In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, this promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness, continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received this word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And I know you guys spent time on this, looking at this last week, but this is the point now where people have been told, this is who the Lord is. And this is how we respond to him. This is how we make him Lord of our life. This is how we make him Lord of our life. When we're gutted, when we're cut to the heart and we say, I need a savior. I need the Lord. This is how you do that. And I bring that up from a terminology standpoint because I think it's really important. We mentioned this at the end on, on Wednesday night. Sometimes when we approach a presentation of the gospel, we can do it along the lines of, okay, so here we are, you know, all of sin and fall short of the, the glory of God, the wages of sin is death, and so we recognize here's the penalty of sin, we're separated from God, therefore we need a savior, this is how we then be saved, right? Awesome, right? I'm tracking with all of that, but if we're not careful, what we can do is put in the emphasis then on the saving part, rather than putting the emphasis on making Jesus your Lord. Because if you're focusing just on, I need to do this so that sometime in the future I will not go to hell, what we've done is we've made the, the gospel plan of salvation a fire insurance policy for sometime in the future that we're going to have to cash in, right? I don't want to live like that. Right. I don't want to live like it's something that's going to happen in the future and therefore I'm going to avoid that. I want to live as Jesus is my Lord and has lordship over my life. That's what 236 is all about. Amen. And we have to grasp that. That's right. Okay? We have to. That is the crux of the gospel message. It's about Jesus. Right? But we respond to Jesus. We call upon his name. That's how we do it. That's how Peter says we do it in verse 38. And this is where it gets really important, okay? I had, this, had a gospel meeting last weekend, and when I came back on, on the Saturday, because we did Saturday morning and afternoon sessions, I had something hanging on my door, um, and my family were all out, so it was just me. When I came back, I had this, this cool little thing hanging on the door, and I'm not going to talk about any other groups. It actually was really cool. It was an invitation to a church, and it looked awesome. And it was really cool, like the snapshot of, this is what we're all about, and this is who we are. And I looked at that, and I thought, oh, good on them. That's really neat. I love how they're doing that. And I flipped it over on the back, and it mentioned some of those verses I just talked about, right? Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. In other words, there is sin, and we're guilty of it, and we need a Savior. And it laid out all of those aspects. And in the final step, it said, it looked at Romans chapter 10, and it said, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved... And they said, if you want to call upon the name of the Lord, say this prayer. And I was tracking with all of that up until that point. Because in Acts chapter 2, when Peter quotes that exact same passage that's quoted in Romans 10 from Joel chapter 2, he says, therefore, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then when he shows the response on how to do that, it's not just saying a prayer right? The response is clear as day in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, that there has to be repentance, there has to be an immersion in the name of Jesus Christ under his authority for the, for, for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins, and when we do that, we'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
So let Scripture dictate what the definition of that term is. Because we here call upon the name of the Lord, and we could think you do that in many different ways. But Scripture is pretty clear on how to do that. The exact same terminology is used in Acts chapter 22, right? When Luke is recording Paul's conversion, in verse 12 through 16, it says, Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, he came to me, and standing by me, he said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight, and I saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. So that's a calling that he's given to Saul, who becomes Paul. Verse 16, why do you wait? Right? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Let scripture define how to do that. Well. Okay? Thank you. Let Scripture define how to do that. There's the response. So as Peter preaches on Pentecost, it's all about showing that Jesus is the Christ and Jesus is Lord. So we just have to respond in turn and make that decision to make him Lord of our life. And when we do that, right, what happens? So from there on, from the rest of the chapter on, you then have this snapshot of what it looks like for people who live that way, okay? I put this picture up for a reason. It's um, um, a building, right? It's actually, it's an old church building. It no longer is, right? It's now an art gallery, right? But it was an old church building in the city of Edinburgh, right, which is where I'm from. And back in 2000, and, oh man, it must have been 2009, that was a while ago now, right? All right, 2009. We went on a survey trip to look at areas with a team, areas where we could do church planting. And one of the places we had considered was, was Edinburgh. And we were speaking to a church in Edinburgh and thinking how, it's a massive city. It's our capital city. So how can we plant another congregation in, in another part of town on the complete other side of the city? And when we were doing that, we, we just stopped by and check this building out because we knew of it. And it's a group that referred to themselves as the Glassites or the Sandemanians, doesn't matter from a church history standpoint. But I bring this up because when you go in and you look through this building and you look through this auditorium, they have their sign. It used to be hanging on the outside and now it's kind of a historical marker and it's on the corridor on the inside. So it says, if you can look at it because it's quite faded because it's really old, the meeting house commonly called the Glassites or Sandemanians of the Church of Christ for public worship. See, because when this group, the Glassites or the Sandemanians, those were, that was John Glass or Mr. Sandeman, they were kind of looking at, you know, theology to follow or whatever. They looked in scripture at Romans 16 and they said, Churches of Christ, there's a biblical name, so we're going to use that, right? So this was their sign. But this is interesting here, because underneath it, it says this, prayer reading of the word, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and the breaking of bread. So here's this group a couple hundred years ago that in this building looked at this passage that we're about to look at, and they said, this is what the church of Christ, a church of Christ, the church belonging to Christ, should be focusing on, because in Acts chapter 2, when all of those people who individually made a commitment to put on Jesus as Lord and responded through repentance, responded through baptism, put Jesus on as Lord, received the remission of their sins, received the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not just an individual thing because they're now added to the church. Acts 2 talks about that. The Lord adds to the church daily those who are being saved, right? And so at this point, it goes from this individual response to this community of people who have all made that response, right? So now what happens as a result? Well, this group looked at the passage and said, well, a church of Christ, Christ's church, that we see established on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, this is what they should be focusing on. Prayer, reading of the word, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and the breaking of bread. 
So that's what they keyed in on. And I love that. And my clicker stopped working. So if you could advance the slide. Thank you. So this is where they get that. Because once you've made this decision to follow, now what does life look like together with all of these people that are there on Pentecost on that day? So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And they devoted themselves to prayers. Right? I added that verb, I added that devoted in there for each of those breakdowns because I think that's important while we read it. This is what they devoted themselves to. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, verse 46, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And the response that, has, that people have as they see this, right, because we're going to break this down in a second, but 43 shows a response and 47 shows a response. Now, things change in Jerusalem in Acts, and we're going to get to that in the next few chapters. But at first, awe comes upon every soul. How can these people live this way? This is so different from what we've ever been accustomed to. And these signs and miracles are being done through the apostles there. And, and this response then as people saw the needs, because if you remember Pentecost, people were there from all over all over the known world when you break down all those countries and they've now arrived in Jerusalem for a special feast day and of those there are now a bunch of people who are like tourists visitors from out of town and they've arrived on Pentecost and they've realized I need to make Jesus my Lord right and so now they're here and they're in Jerusalem so you're sitting there with your one suitcase with a few clothes in it and now you're staying a lot longer than you planned on staying as you're trying to figure out, well, what does it look like as I make Jesus my Lord? And so there was very distinct needs that happened. But the, the thing that I love about this picture, though, is the steps that people were willing to go to in order to meet needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ. Guys, never, never lose that passion, right? Never lose that passion. Go back to the word that they focused on in verse 42. They were what? They were devoted. They were devoted. And so as they saw this, they stepped up. But we're going to cover that in a second. But let's start here, right? Devotion. It's more than just, this is something we have to do. Devotion is this word, unrelenting. Unrelenting love for and or loyalty to something or someone else. And so as this group gather, who individually have all made a decision to put Jesus on as Lord, now they're all together, and they have an unrelenting love for what? The apostles' doctrine, right? For fellowship, for breaking of bread, and for prayers. That's an unrelenting love. That is a devotion. That's more than just, this is something we have to do. This is something that with all of our heart, we want to do. Right. A response from being cut to the heart like Noah brought up to us earlier, right? This is an overflow from, we have, the Lord has done so much for us. We, we crucified the Lord and now we're saved and now we get to live this, right? This is the response that happens as a result. And so this is the first part that they're devoted to, right? So let's talk about this real quickly because when you look through Scripture, Time and time again, one of the things that we see in this recurring theme is the apostles' teaching, the apostles' doctrine. As we go through Acts, you see that being played out as they're teaching. And as we start looking then at the epistles and the things that are recorded, the churches in Galatia and Ephesus and Corinth, they're hanging on the apostles' teaching, right? They're focusing on the apostles' teaching, and that's what they're following. So let's look at some 
verses that, that kind of give a glimpse into what the apostles saw and what they were teaching in order for us to, to think about that so we can likewise be devoted to it. That which was from the beginning, this is 1 John chapter 1, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So he's focusing now on Jesus and he's saying, we were eyewitnesses. We have heard, we have seen, we have touched, we know, right? John, one of the apostles is writing this. The life was made manifest. We have seen it. We testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. For that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So as John begins in 1 John and he's writing, you'll make my joy complete by being in fellowship with us being in fellowship with the Father, being in fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ. And if you want to be in fellowship with the Father and fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ, you've got to be doing what we're proclaiming to you. You've got to be listening to what we're handing down to you, the apostles' doctrine, the teachings. And if you follow that and if you respond to that, then we can then be in fellowship with him. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? That's John and what he records and what he writes. I love how Peter, one of the other apostles, puts it in 2 Peter, right? And this is key because it also gives us then this background of we can trust what we're reading because of the authority of Scripture, because who is it that it's his plan and it all coming around anyway? Verse 16, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, we saw it, we lived it, we were there. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, and then he uses this illustration, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So as the apostles taught and as the church clung to the apostles' doctrine, it's inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And as it's recorded, as we see in verse 21, that men spoke from God, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, it's recorded, we can hold it in our hands to this day. We are blessed beyond all measure because we can have the apostles' doctrine. We can have the apostles' teaching. As we go through and we spend time devoted in this, like the early church were in Acts 2, 42, unrelentless, unrelenting love for this, right? Relentless love for this. If we devote our lives to this, man, what a fruit can happen in communities of faith as a result of that, right? That's what they were focused on, the early church on Pentecost, okay? Can you go ahead and click it forward for me, please, Adrian? Thank you. Similarly, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is he. So we've looked at Peter, we've looked at John. Similarly, Paul also says this exact thing in verse 15, in, in chapter 15. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, and in which you stand, and in which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And then we have what he delivers as first importance in verse 3, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And then after that, he goes through all the people that he appeared to from an eyewitness point. But Paul's point is, I received this directly. And as a result of me receiving this, I am giving it to you. Pay heed to it. Hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. The apostles' doctrine, right? It was crucial 
for them to devote themselves to that and for them to focus on that. Hadrian, if you could advance, please. All right, so the second part that they're devoted to is, is this word, okay? Koinonia, right? And we sometimes translate it as communion. We sometimes translate it as fellowship. If you could advance, uh, Hadrian. So the ultimate picture of it is actually just this exact same context of this verse. We don't have to start going to other places to look at it when, it, when we're talking about the Apostles' Doctrine, for example. Right here, if you want to know what true fellowship in the faith looks like, what were they not willing to do for one another? Because it becomes more, more than just an individual, I'm here, I'm attending, I need to respond to the gospel, this is a me and God thing. I don't see that in Acts chapter 2. Because here at the end, it's now a community thing and a response together as they all figure out what life together in faith looks like. And so they were all together, verse 44, had all things in common. If there was anything that was needed, then I'm, what do I, stuff, just stuff. I'll sell the stuff so that we can meet the needs of brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you want to look at fellowship, it became a daily thing in verse 46. Day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, receiving their food with glad and generous hearts. And the result of it is this praising God and having favor with all the people. This is a lifestyle. It, it, it means that church isn't just a calendar event, right? It's a community. It's a lifestyle. And it's being part of the people of God. And it's relational. It's relational. Our walk with God, yes, it's an individual thing, but it's also a relational thing with one another. And it's a beautiful picture of that. And so when we're looking at this group then, that we are relentless in love for fellowship, we hear fellowship and we think potluck meal. Yes. All right. Okay. Okay. That's cool because I love the chats I'm able to have during our potluck meals. But it's bigger than that. And it's more than that. And as you see in verse 46, it's a day by day thing. Right? And it's a, a relational aspect. But I, I, love, I love that picture that we have as a result. Um, here we go. Two things I want to highlight from this because we love our opportunities to fellowship here. Yesterday, I took some very tasty vanilla cream to the face on numerous occasions, Amen. right? Yeah. As, did, as did Jim. And it was fun. Yesterday was fun, right? It was fun. And it was a laugh. But we also had some amazing conversations in the midst of that, shared some of our struggles, laughed at and rejoiced at some of the things going on in our life. It was a fellowship opportunity. When we do things like our picnic paloozas, it's not just, hey, let's all have a laugh. It's opportunities to be intentional about fellowship. If you look at your bulletin, there's some other opportunities to be intentional about that that are coming up. So the first one that I see right here, November 2nd, right? I love Casey and Connie for, for organizing this. So the, there's going to be a group here that's meeting, on the, uh, meeting at the building on Saturday, November 2nd, from 9.30 on, specifically for widows and widowers. Because oftentimes we'll be like, oh, let's do all of our activities for our kids or whatever. But this is a group that, that we're, we're passionate about making sure that we're able to have these intentional fellowship moments, right? And so I love how, how that's really on their heart, right? You've got the ladies' breakfast coming up at the end of, of, of Saturday. We've got Thanksgiving coming up. We're going to have a Thanksgiving dinner here, right? So there's different things that I wanted to highlight because we try and do these things, not just to do them for the sake of doing, but to have these fellowship connection moments so that we can do one another right? Live out those one another principles. And just like the early church in Acts chapter 2, do those things. And I would encourage you to continue looking at those and plugging into those. But I would also encourage you to think this way. Don't just rely on the programs. We offer all of those programs to give us so many opportunities to yeah. do it. But Acts chapter 2 is an organic, relational thing. And so if there are members here that you're clicking with, that God has put it on your heart to click with, awesome. Explore those opportunities. Hang out, get coffees, have dinner together, have people in your home. Do those opportunities as well because fellowship comes 
organically more so than it does from the program standpoint. We just try and give as many opportunities as possible to do that, all right? I stuck an image up there, okay? And we don't necessarily, we often like announce these, but don't necessarily talk about them all that much. This is our chance to do some of the things that we just read about in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, being devoted to the apostles' teaching, being devoted to fellowship, being devoted to breaking of bread, and being devoted to prayers. And on a Sunday evening throughout our city, throughout Onslow County, we have groups from here that do just that and practice these things, okay? I want you to be aware of those because it's been a while since we've put anything up and talked about them specifically other than just saying this group meets here then, this group meets here then, this group meets here then. And so we have a group that's up in Richlands. We have a group that's Jacksonville North or Half Moon. That's our, uh, our house. We've got a group that meets at Safe Southwest. It's just off of 258. That's Betsy's. And we've got a group that meets out in Piney Green, right? We've got a group that meets here at the building. We have a group that is about to resume in Sneets Ferry, all right? So if you are looking at a way to connect more and you think, all right, this is something that I would like to do, please, the, right here is the contact details of all the people on the back page of your bulletin, right? Cell phones are there, email addresses are there. Please reach out. We'll happy, happily answer any questions that you may have about them. It's our chance to do life together with that, all right? Heads up on this one for tonight. Piney Green Group, okay? Helen had surgery this week, so we're obviously not all gonna pitch up at her house, right? So, Piney Green Group, Scott, wave, Scott Brewer back there, uh, it's gonna be at his house this evening, is that correct? All right, Pam's nodding, I'm not getting this from Pam, so that's good, right? Yeah. So it's gonna be at the Brewer house, and you guys will just coordinate with Helen on what that looks like going out from here. So every now and then we'll have announcements where we've got curveballs like that come our way, but it's our chance to practice some of these things that we just looked at in Scripture that's the crux of the matter when it comes to that, all right? So then they also were devoted to the breaking of bread uh, with one another, right? And that communion time that they had with one another. I think of this from two aspects from this passage, okay? One is what we had the chance to do earlier. And again, I'm thankful for Noah's thoughts as he brought us around the Lord's table Every first day of the week, every Lord's Day, we gather. And this is part of what we do every time that we meet, okay? Because one, we see the early church doing it in Acts chapter 2. And two, the Lord commanded us to do it. So we gather so we can do this do in remembrance of me. We partake of the bread, we partake of the cup, and we're reminded of that sacrifice that he's made for us and the covenant relationship we have with him as a result, okay? So that was very much an aspect of what they did. But you also saw in Acts chapter 2 um, another aspect of it as well. You can go ahead and pass that one, Hadrian. Oh, it worked. Nice one. You also saw in Acts chapter 2 another aspect as well, right? Where in verse 46, day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. This is the life moments. It's not just this, right? This is the, I'm meeting on a Thursday and I'm having a meal. It's the table moments. Two years ago, I did a sermon called Table Moments. And we looked at the table moments of Jesus and the interactions that he was able to have with his followers, right? Sometimes with his enemies. What those, react, what those interactions looked like all around different tables throughout Jerusalem and, and Galilee and all of that area. We have those opportunities all the time. And if you're not comfortable with it being your table, Call up someday and see if their table is available, right? Or go to Chili's because their table is always available for a fee. But hey, right? And if you don't like Chili's, there's plenty of other restaurants in Jacksonville, right? There's millions of them. But table moments are important when it comes to the organic building relationships and fellowship moments. And the early believers recognized that as they met their needs and did that. And this was the last one that they were devoted to. All right? To prayer. Amen. To prayer. I, I changed my terminology a few years ago because I, re I recognized a lot of times when people would share something with me and it would be a heartfelt moment and they would say, I've got this going on in my life. I would often respond with, I'll pray for you, right? I'll pray for you. And that is a great response if I actually do it. But sometimes it could easily just kind of become a platitude of, I'll, I'll pray for you. 
and I changed it because now my response, I hope anyway, I tend to be more along the lines of, let me pray with you on that and do it on the here and now. If we can be a body who are devoted, relentless in this, right? Relentless in this. And let God shape our hearts towards prayer, our communities of faith towards prayer. What kind of impact can we have throughout this whole area, right? And so this focus that they were devoted to last reminds me of this in in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7, and we're, we're wrapping up. But I want us to finish on this point. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I know a lot of people right now who need to feel that peace of God because of various storms that are going on in their lives. And I want to lead a prayer right now. And I'm going to try and keep it general because I'll be honest, I have such a long list even in my head. I know I'll probably unintentionally leave someone out and I don't don't want to do that. Um, But I know we have a number of people that are tuned in online because they can't be here because of various health stuff, right? Whether that be a heart issue or a cancer issue or, you know, or or a broken hip or whatever the case may be. There are just so many things going on right now in our lives. Um, we've got Landon just returned from Western North Carolina, right? Melissa's grandson, okay? He was a lineman out there, and he returned safely from that. We've got our own Caleb is heading out this afternoon, all right, to be part of a recovery team to head up there. So I'm about to say a prayer, and I'm going to specifically mention you, brother, and everything that's going to be going on with, with you in this next... You're up there for, what, three weeks? Two weeks? Uh, it should be the re- just this week. For, okay, all right. Recycle and okay. go back. All right, excellent. So he'll be up there through this week. So keep Caleb in your prayers and all the guys they're working with. Casey's about to head up there as well, right, with, with his work. So there's a lot. There's a lot that's going on that affects even just our own body life. We have to be relentless in prayer, devoted to prayer. That's what the early church did, right? So why can we not model that? So I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Then afterwards, I'm going to have the invitation call, and, and, and Brother Terry will lead us uh, in the invitation song. So let's go ahead and go to our Father in prayer. Father, we are thankful for the fact that we can be your people. We are thankful for the fact that we can gather as people who have put Jesus on as Lord of our lives. Help us to do that daily. Help us to live as people who are under your Lordship. Help us to be as effective as we can be as disciples, recognizing that as we mess up on that, and we will, that we can continue to grow as we continue to walk towards you and be in fellowship with you, be in fellowship with the Son, and be in fellowship with one another. Father, we are thankful for grace in those moments. Um, And Father, we we talk about the peace that passes all understanding that, that only you can provide. Father, in so many different situations in our lives right now as a body, we we crave that. We need it and we want it. Uh, we, we crave it for uh, our residents out in the western part of this state with everything that they've gone through. And we pray for those that are about to be up there helping with them. We pray for Caleb. We pray for Casey uh, as they're going to be heading out this week and, and a little bit further down the line too. Uh, we pray for all those affected and we pray that we, just like what we, what we see here in Acts chapter 2, that there, there, there won't be anything we're not willing to do to help out, that we can feel convicted to continue to meet the needs of, of, of brothers and sisters and people who are crying out for help in a physical way. Help us to have a heart that desires to meet those needs, uh, Father, and help us to be in tune to our own body and the needs that are, that are there. Help us, to, help us to continue to have a heart that reaches out to those as well. Help us to be devoted to one another most especially to you. Uh, We're mindful of those who are not here with us with their health situations. Too many names to list. Uh, But Father, we know that that they are in your hands as a great physician and we lift them up to you and we pray for the peace that passes all understanding. We pray for comfort and encouragement and I pray that we can have some of those organic moments in the day-to-day where we can encourage them as well. 
Father, we're thankful for your love for us, your love for your people, and it's through Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. And so the invitation call is here. And you may have some things that you want us to pray with you about in person. And if you want to come forward during that invitation um, to do so, uh, that's the moment where you can do so. Um, maybe you feel convicted in your devotion. And maybe you want to reaffirm, I need to be more devoted to you, Lord, and to your people, Lord. And you want to make a public proclamation of that. And we can help you in that walk. Or maybe you have not yet called on the name of the Lord. And we went through Acts chapter 2 and looked at the response of what that looks like. And we looked at Acts chapter 22 and the response of what that looks like. And if you have not yet repented and been immersed for the remission of your sins and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, then that is available for you, okay? Just as it was available for them then. That's calling upon the name of the Lord. And if you have any need or anything you need to respond to, please feel, fr feel free to come forward while we stand and sing the invitation song. Can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus.